Hello, and welcome to our UW Family Weekend edition of Badger Talks Live, which brings together exciting happenings, resources, and talent from our UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. Hello, everyone. My name is Tamia Folks, and I'm a senior from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, studying in journalism and political science here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. On campus, I serve as the Big Ten's Voting Challenge Coalition, Big Ten Voting Challenge intern, and also as a member of the Andrew Gruden Foundation Ambassador Team. Our work on campus works to educate and inform students about their power as voters and inform them about issues happening in our local community. It is my pleasure today to introduce Professor and Director of the Elections Research Center, Barry Burden. Today, Barry will be giving us a quick glimpse under the hood of map making process and also will discuss the wide variety of ways that, redistrict that redistricting and laws in Wisconsin do or do not keep gerrymandering in check. We'll also learn what can be done about this. Barry Burden is the founder of the Elections Research Center. He holds the Lions Family Chair in Electoral Politics and is a professor of political science. His research interests include civic engagement, Congress, election administration, political parties, representation, and voting behavior, which has earned him several awards for reviews, papers, and teaching. In his eight years at UW, he taught 14 different courses in the political science department and very earned his bachelor's degree from Wittenberg University and PhD from Ohio State. He is also a faculty co-chair of the Badgers Vote Coalition. Please welcome Barry Burden. Well, thank you, Tamia, uh, for that nice introduction. And thanks to Fran and everyone at the Badger Talk team for putting this together. Hello to all of our alums and parents and others who are interested in this topic. Glad to have you with me today for this lunchtime talk on a Friday afternoon in Madison. Um, as Tamia mentioned, I'm involved with the Badgers Vote Coalition. This is a group of faculty, students, and staff on campus. Uh, we've had great fun trying to energize, inform, engage our students, and, uh, and outvote our friends at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so this is a part-time job uh, that's been a real pleasure in addition to my work on redistricting and other things more directly related to research on elections. But let's dig into today's topic, which is what is happening with redistric redistricting. We are right in the middle of the season uh, where that is happening in every state. And so I want to give you a sense of what to watch for, how the process works, and uh, what things are in place that might control the rampant partisanship that's active and in what ways it's uncontrollable at this point. So let me start with just a few basics for those of you who have not spent your time uh, watching this process up close. Uh, this is a really uniquely American phenomenon. We allow legislators in state legislatures all around the country to draw the district lines to elect themselves to the state legislature and to elect members of Congress who many of them hope to be. Uh, these are partisan elected officials drawing lines that are partisan and also about elections. There just are not many other democracies around the world that would create districts in this way. Uh, it's based on census data, which are collected every 10 years by a constitutional requirement. So this is a decennial process. It happens at least once a decade. Uh, sometimes in states, there are additional redistricting cycles. Um, but the, the process we're under, that's underway now is based on the 2020 census. Those data were just delivered to the states this fall, and so state legislatures and other groups are very busy drawing maps based on that new information. You're, as I'm going to show you later in the talk, there aren't many legal constraints that control what map makers do. There are some criteria they need to meet. There are some other criteria that are optional, but really there's a lot of freedom, and that freedom gives map makers the ability to gerrymander. That is to intentionally draw the district lines to favor their side and to disfavor the other side. And by side, we usually mean one political party drawing maps to advantage themselves and to disadvantage the other side. Sometimes also it's one racial group working to disadvantage another. So race and party tend to be the two dominant lines of division in the redistricting process. And how do those map makers do the gerrymandering? They do it through two common techniques you may have heard about called packing and cracking. Packing is drawing district lines to really consolidate your opponents in a small number of districts to over concentrate them in a way so that their votes are wasted. They have more votes than they need to elect a legislator in a particular district. The alternative is to spread your opponents out to crack them, to divide them by drawing district lines 
that dilute their influence by spreading them into several districts. And you're gonna see some examples of how this works in practice. Now, I'll just say, if I had given this talk five or 10 years ago, I doubt there would be much interest. People are talking about this topic. It is something that has really raised to a level of consciousness um, that I've not seen in years of, um, of watching these kinds of efforts. Some examples of this, headlines you will have seen in the news in recent days about census data, about lawsuits, about battles, uh, about both parties trying to get advantage and set themselves up to win control of Congress and of state legislatures in next year's elections that will be run uh, within these new lines. You may have also seen some fun stories making fun of the shapes of some districts. Uh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, this was a district in Pennsylvania, a congressional district that uh, has been called Mickey Mouse kicking Donald Duck, I believe is the title. You can sort of see it there if you look closely. Uh, this district no longer exists, but it was in place. And there was a member of Congress who represented it for a number of years. You also might see editorial cartoons. This is one of my favorite of the eight congressional districts in Wisconsin. Three of those seats are held by Democrats. Those are the donkeys who are squeezed into various shapes. Five of them currently held by Republicans. Those are the elephants. So you, you get there's a lot of attention paid to the shape of districts. And, and we'll be talking about the shape uh, momentarily. But let me just mention, I'm referring to gerrymander with a hard G. Many of you will pronounce it or have heard it as gerrymander. But the truth is the name for that process comes from a person named Elbridge Gary. Elbridge Gary was vice president of the United States. He was governor of Massachusetts. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. There he is. You can see Elbridge still has a Twitter account. There he is in the background as the, as the writers of the declaration are delivering it in Philadelphia. Uh, he signed off on a plan in Massachusetts 200 years ago to draw a funny shaped district that wrapped around the Northwest side of Boston. And an editorial cartoonist thought that it looked like a salamander. As you can see in the graphic on the right, the cartoonist drew a head, some wings, some feet, and called it a gerrymander. All right, so that's the origin of the term. Um, and it's still with us today. The, the Gary family, I've been in touch with them to some degree. Uh, they're not happy about the legacy of that being attached to their family, but they are insistent that Gary is the way to pronounce it. So let me raise a few misconceptions, things that may bother you or that seem suspicious about the process. I wanna put some of those to bed so that we can draw attention to other things about the process that are bothersome to me. It's, it's probably a different set than the kinds of complaints you've heard about in the public. One misconception is that an ugly shaped district is a telltale sign of a problem that by drawing districts in a funny way with lots of tentacles, like the district that's on the right, that map makers have done something nefarious. The truth is map makers have enough data and expertise and consultants. They can draw really malicious districts that advantage their side and disadvantage the other side without having to resort to funny shapes. And sometimes just by chance, a district has a kind of nice shape and also has some other problems. The district on the left is the one I'm sitting in now in Southern Wisconsin, it's a, it's a very democratic district, includes Madison. It's a pretty nice shape. It's sort of a, a rectangle with a couple extra appendages. Uh, so in terms of the look of it, you wouldn't notice anything peculiar, but it's not a competitive district. This is not a place where realistically a Republican candidate could be elected to Congress. In contrast, the district on the right, which has this crazy shape, some people refer to it as the earmuffs district because it has these two pieces. It was drawn to comply with the Voting Rights Act. It's a funny looking district because it includes a large Mexican American community in one of those earmuffs and a large Puerto Rican community in the other. And by connecting them, it's possible to create a majority Hispanic district. And that district has pretty reliably elected a Hispanic member of Congress. So this is something that's, that's mandated in a way by the Voting Rights Act. And so it was done for a noble purpose the result was a pretty ugly district. And so this, this is sort of a, a theme of today's talk that drawing districts is difficult and balancing various criteria, including the shape of the district are just not always possible. So I'll, I'll just emphasize for you that drawing districts is hard. There are a lot of criteria that need to be met. There are universal criteria you see listed on the left-hand side here that all districts need to meet. And then many states in the listing on the right-hand side have their own criteria. 
every district needs to have essentially the same population as other districts in the same state. So equal population is the most obvious criterion. Districts also need to be contiguous. They need to be all of one piece. It's not permitted to draw a district that has two separate blobs that are unconnected. Many states also require districts to be as compact as possible. So being a kind of nice shape like a rectangle or a circle. Many states require districts to try to adhere to county lines or municipal lines or school districts uh, or other well-known political geographies, maybe even natural geography in the state, uh, keeping communities of interest together. There are lots of things pulling on this process that cannot all be satisfied simultaneously. So map makers have to make some decisions and it's, it's sometimes the unfortunate part of that or the, the criterion that gets sacrificed that uh, uh, people tend to zoom on, zoom in on as a problem. So as an example of it not being easy, uh, there are sometimes cries from the public to take this completely out of the hands of politicians and out of the hands of people and let computers draw the maps. Here's an example of a story that was in Vox uh, a year or two ago, looking at the current congressional districts in North Carolina. There are 13 of them. You can see that in the map up above. And a lot of them have really ugly shapes, long skinny snakes that run across parts of the state uh, for good reason. Uh, at the bottom is a plan that a computer scientist produced where a computer drew what look like 13 nicely shaped districts. Uh, they don't have long tentacles. The trouble is that they violate the Voting Rights Act. They do not keep together communities of interest. They divide cities, they divide counties. Uh, the only thing they have going for them are really that they have equal population and they sort of look like nice parallelograms or triangles. But everything else about them would not be acceptable under the law or I think to most residents of North Carolina or other states. So handing this over to a kind of technology to take over the process is really just not feasible. It is a human process um, for all the good and bad that that entails. The other complaint about redistricting is that it results in polarization or it fosters party polarization by having districts that are strongly supportive of a Republican candidate or places where only a Democratic candidate could win. It maybe fosters a feeling among legislators that they don't need to listen to voters. And the only thing to worry about is maybe losing in a primary, which might cause them to be more polarized. But there's actually not much good political science research suggesting that polarization is enhanced by the redistricting process. If anything, it's a small effect. And that's because polarization is trucking along on its own just fine. Thank you. It doesn't need redistricting or other things that often get attached to it. Uh, the parties are moving apart in the electorate and in elective office. A couple examples of this. Here's a, a study from the Pew Research Center asking the public in two different time periods, 1994 and 2017, about 20 years apart, a series of policy questions. There were 10 questions put to the public. And from those questions, they scaled each person as being uh, on, a, on a range from consistently liberal in their opinions to consistently conservative, and then looked at those separately for Republicans and Democrats. And you can see that just uh, a, really a generation ago, there was a massive overlap between Democrats and Republicans. There were lots of moderate Democrats, maybe even conservative, lots of moderate to liberal Republicans. And so the relationship between a person's party and their policy views wasn't really strict. But over time, those two blobs have moved apart. And by 2017, you can see that the Democrats and Republicans are very distinct in their opinions. That happened without redistricting. That's something that's going on in the public quite independently. And even if we look at election results uh, in a unit that is not affected by redistricting, you can see polarization in voting happening over time. This is a figure from the New York Times showing which counties in the United States had lopsided outcomes, outcomes where one party won by more than 20 percentage points in a presidential election. Now these county election results are not affected by redistricting because county boundaries don't change. They've been in place in most places for decades. But you can see that over this series of six elections, more and more counties show up as being colored red or blue because Republicans are winning them overwhelmingly. There's really not a contest there or Democrats are winning them overwhelmingly. In this environment, it would be difficult to draw districts 
that did not look polarized, that did not have a, a strong Republican or Democratic bent to them uh, district by district. It's just the nature of the political geography of the country. So polarization is not really the main thing that concerns me. My concern is about how redistricting insulates the legislature from public control. It really makes the control of legislature, which party is in charge and what shares of the seats the parties hold, uh, out of the reach of the public because the districts protect the legislature from tides that seem to favor one party or the other. There are also some other negative consequences. I think the redistricting process is hostile and nasty enough that it really taints the legislative process and makes it hard for legislators to work together. Once they've had a knockdown drag out battle about the redistricting process, often right at the beginning of the year after an election. It's also distasteful to the public. So I think it lowers evaluations of what the public think about their legislature and about their government. But in terms of the functioning of government, I think the real problem is that the legislature no longer is accountable to the public if an effective gerrymander has been enacted. So to illustrate this, I want you to think about using your mouse at a computer. The mouse is the input device. You're moving it around uh, with your hand because you want to see the output, which is the cursor on the screen, also move around. So let's think about now election results, how people vote as the input. That's like you moving the mouse on your desktop and the movement of the cursor being like the, the results in terms of the seats that are won by Republicans and Democrats in the Congress or in the state legislature. There are two ways that political scientists have developed to judge this relationship between the input and the output. One measure is called responsiveness, and that's the degree to which changing the votes for the parties would actually change how many seats they win. In other words, if you move the mouse around from left to right on your screen, you should see the cursor also moving, right? If the cursor does not move as a result of you moving the mouse or moving the mouse a lot is required just to move the cursor a small amount, then we would say that that is unresponsive. And in the same way, if the votes for the parties change, but the shares of the, the seats held by the two parties do not change much, we would say that that is an unresponsive legislature. It's really out of the control of the public. There's a second criterion you may not have thought about as much, something called symmetry. Symmetry is the idea that the two parties should be treated equally. So if the vote breakdown in an election was 60% for the Republicans and 40% for the Democrats, you would see a certain share of the seats for the two parties, probably not a 60-40 breakdown, but an advantage for the winning party. But if the roles were reversed and the other party had won 60% of the vote, you should expect to see equivalent vote shares just flipped, uh, equivalent seat shares just flipped. So the system should treat the parties equally if one wins versus the other. Now, in terms of the mouse analogy, you can think about moving your mouse left to right. The cursor ought to go to the right if you drag the mouse to the right, and it ought to move to the left by an equal amount if you move the mouse to the left an equal amount. So the degree to which that is not happening uh, would be a breakdown in symmetry. So these two metrics can be used to judge a particular map, to judge a set of outcomes, or even to inform a judge or a court that's considering a redistricting case. Now, what prevents a political party from ignoring these two concerns and drawing a map that advantages them as much as possible? Well, some of the guardrails that had been in place, some of the legal protections have been removed by the Supreme Court in two relatively recent Supreme Court cases I want to tell you about. The court has been slowly tearing away, I think, some of the protections that have limited the ability of the dominant party to try to gain advantage over the minority. And these uh, have been, these are two important ones that have been taken away. The first of these two cases is known as Shelby County v. Holder. Shelby County is a county in Alabama. Uh, they filed suit in federal court because the federal government didn't allow them to make changes to some of their election procedures in the county. And that's because they were under a section of the Voting Rights Act. There's section two, actually two sections, four and five, that put some parts of the country under a formula that prevented them from making changes to their elections without getting permission of the federal government. This goes back to when the Voting Rights Act was passed in the 1960s. And you can see that Alabama is one of the covered states. Most of the states that needed to get preclearance were unsurprisingly in the South. Uh, and this had been the process for 50 years. And so if a state wanted to change its districts, it would need to first get preclearance from the federal government. 
to say that this was not going to be discriminatory against minority voters. The Shelby County case made its way to the Supreme Court and in 2013, a majority decided that in fact the formula in the Voting Rights Act that required some parts of the country but not others to get preclearance was unconstitutional. And the majority opinion that John Roberts uh, crafted said, look, this was a formula based on 40 year old facts on information from the 1960s and we think it doesn't apply. Uh, that meant that sections four and five of the Voting Rights Act were tossed aside and they're no longer in place. So that guardrail that required uh, communities mostly in these Southern states to get permission before changing the districts is no longer there. Now, the liberal minority on the court, in their dissenting opinion, disagreed pretty strongly. This is the opinion from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, she said, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. So a, a very strong difference of opinion there in whether Shelby County was decided correctly, uh, but the outcome is what it is. And now for eight years, we've been living without those formulas. Uh, there is a plan in Congress to maybe renew that, uh, but at the moment it is stymied in the Senate. An example of how the preclearance worked, I'll just show you a before and after in North Carolina, those same 13 districts we talked about a moment ago. Up above are the initial districts that were proposed in North Carolina. Republicans were in charge of the process. They drew a map that favored their party and they produced some pretty ugly districts. Um, those were struck down because they were not given preclearance before the Shelby County decision. Once Shelby County was struck down, the maps were redrawn. This time the argument was that the maps were drawn on the basis of partisanship, not on the basis of race. The districts are somewhat better looking. You can see in the bottom part of that picture, but pretty closely resemble what the state would have liked to enact before the Shelby County decision changed things. Now, the legislator who was most involved in this process, we're gonna see him in a moment, North, North Carolina ends up being a really important player in all of this redistricting uh, litigation over the years. So that's, that's case one, dealing with the Voting Rights Act. Case two is much more recent and it has a Wisconsin connection. The case at the top that made its way to the Supreme Court is Rucho v. Common Cause. Rucho is a state legislator from North Carolina. The districts in North Carolina were challenged as a partisan gerrymander, an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. That case got connected to another case from Maryland where the Democrats had drawn the districts. And it was alleged that those districts were an, an unconstitutional gerrymander. And it was attached to a Wisconsin case about the Wisconsin State Assembly. So these are not congressional districts. These are state legislative districts. These are the current 99 districts. All three of these cases were sent up to the Supreme Court essentially together. And the plaintiffs, uh, particularly the plaintiffs from Wisconsin, argued that the maps should be deemed unconstitutional because there was evidence that the majority party, in this case, the Republicans, had drawn the maps intentionally to favor one side and to disfavor the other based on a person's viewpoint. That, that that was a very effective map. It was durable and really locked in an advantage. And there was no legitimate reason for doing it. It wasn't as though it had to be done because that was the geography of the state or that it was meeting some other kinds of criteria. Uh, so these were the maps drawn 10 years ago by the Republican majority in Wisconsin. Uh, that case, which is really led by the North Carolina element of it, ended up not striking down any of the maps. The conservative majority in the case said essentially, this is not an issue for us. This is a matter of partisan politics and not a matter of constitutional law. The majority opinion said that partisan gerrymandering claims present political questions that are beyond the reach of the federal courts. In other words, don't bring us any more cases like this. This is a non-justiciable issue for the federal courts. So there's, there's really no more role for the Supreme Court or the federal courts in any state to do anything about partisanship in congressional districts. Now, if it involves race or some other uh, legal implications, the federal courts may be involved, but if it's merely one party versus another, the courts have said, that's not a matter for us, that's a matter for the public or for legislators uh, to deal with. Now, the liberal minority on the court, as you can imagine, disagreed with this. Uh, they saw gerrymandering as a really pernicious problem and said, if it's left unchecked, it may irreparably damage our system of government. So again, strong division of opinion on the court, but the conservative majority again prevailed. And so this last guardrail that really 
prevented parties from going full tilt to draw maps that advantage them as much as possible is, is no longer present. Now, I mentioned that the lead case came out of North Carolina. This is the representative who had a, a key role in it. His name is David Lewis, and he was chair of the elections committee uh, in drawing those maps. And he was asked, for the 13 congressional districts in North Carolina, why did you draw them so that 10 went to the Republicans and only three to the Democrats? That seems very lopsided in a state that's, that's pretty competitive. It's sort of a purple state. And he said, the reason is, uh, the re the, I proposed to draw a map that had 10 Republican seats and three Democrats because I didn't think it was possible to draw a map that had 11 Republicans and two Democrats. So he's essentially admitting, I tried to make this map as partisan as possible, and 10 was all that I could squeeze out of the 13 districts. And those districts are essentially in place today because of the Rucho decision. And the Rucho decision is now sitting behind the scenes as states go to work on the drawing of the next set of district lines. So let's go back to the Wisconsin districts that were also involved in this case. I wanna have a deeper look at them because so many of us care about what's happening in Wisconsin politics and also to demonstrate how those two measures of responsiveness and symmetry play out in a real example. Responsiveness and symmetry. So this is back to that analogy between the movement of the mouse having an effect on the cursor that's on your screen. There should be a, a strong and symmetric connection between those two things if everything is working right. In other words, there should be a relationship between the votes that people cast for candidates representing the two parties and the shares of seats that the two parties end up winning in the legislature. Well, let me show you how this worked in Wisconsin. Here are the votes and the seats won back in the 2008 assembly election. So there are 99 assembly seats in the lower chamber. All of them are up at once. The 2008 election was the year that Barack Obama won the presidency and he won Wisconsin by a lot. So it was a good year for the Democrats. And unsurprisingly, you can see that Democrats won about 56% of all of the votes that were cast for all of the assembly candidates around the state. Republicans won the other 44. In terms of the seats that were won, of the 99, Democrats got 52 and Republicans 46. So Democrats didn't get quite as many seats as you might think they should based on their vote. There's a little bit of a, a penalty there, but it's, it's close to proportional. It, it doesn't seem completely out of line that that would be the outcome. Now, this election occurred before the current maps got put into place. Those were drawn after the 2010 census put into place in 2011. The next set of elections was 2012 also a presidential election, also featuring Obama at the top of the ticket. He won that race, not by as much, but it too was a good year for the Democrats. You can see that if you add up all the votes cast for the assembly candidates, Democrats this time won 53% of the vote, Republicans won 47. So Democrats have still won the majority of the votes in the state. It's not surprising given how well they did at the top of the ticket, but now suddenly under the new assembly districts, the ones that were challenged in the Supreme Court, Democrats only get 39 of the 99 seats. So only about 40% of the seats, despite winning 53% of the vote. This was the evidence that was before the courts. And um, they said that may be troubling, but it's not a constitutional issue for us. So these are the districts that remain in place today in Wisconsin. Now, another way to think about this lack of responsiveness is to look at how elections actually turn out in these 99 districts. So the figure I'm showing you here are 99 dots arraying those districts from the most democratic in their vote for uh, president to the most Republican. And you can see that a majority end up having uh, Republican winners. But what's interesting is that the maps were drawn so that there are a large number of districts where Republican candidates can expect to get about 55 to 60, maybe 65% of the vote. So it's a safe amount. It, it makes a Republican candidate comfortable that they're likely to win re-election, uh, but it's not so much that it's wasting the votes of their party. They're not excessively packing Republicans into districts. So in that sense, it's a very efficient gerrymander. The Republicans did a terrific job of really pulling off a beautiful map that advantaged them in many districts. Now look on the other side, what's happened in districts that are Democratic leaning. Most of them actually have no Republican opponent at all. The Republican vote share is zero. There are about 20 or 25 districts there sitting at the bottom of the graph where Republicans didn't even bother to run a candidate. Uh, 
because they knew that the Democrats were packed so heavily, something they had done in drawing the maps that it wasn't worth contesting. There are only six districts in the entire state out of the 99 where there are two candidates on the ballot and the Democrat managed to win. Whereas there are many more competitive districts where Republicans have just enough edge to be comfortable. So this is really good evidence of the effectiveness of that map. And, th and these are data from 2018. So this is an election seven years after the map was put into place. It's a year when Democrats did very well. They won all five statewide races in Wisconsin, including the governorship and a Senate race, but it simply did not translate to uh, races for the state legislature. Now, one more way of looking at this is to consider some of the evidence that was presented in the litigation about the Wisconsin districts. And I'm gonna show you here, this may be the most technical thing we look at in the talk. This is an analysis by Professor Joey Chen, who's part of the evidence in the case. And he was investigating whether the maps for the assembly in Wisconsin had to be drawn the way they were. Maybe Republicans were compelled to draw maps that advantage their party because they were trying to keep together counties or, or something else. There was some other criterion that was really uh, forcing them to do that. So the way he investigated it was to use a computer to simulate maps. And he built in all the criteria we would care about. He needed the districts to be of equal population. He wanted them to be reasonably compact. He wanted to follow natural boundaries. He wanted to comply with the Voting Rights Act. And so what's on the, the, the scatter plots that's in the upper left-hand part of the figure are 200 simulations, 200 times that he asked the computer to draw the 99 districts. Along the bottom, you have the number of those districts that ended up favoring Republicans out of 99. So, uh, you know, in, in the sort of middle of his simulations, you would expect Republicans to get about 43 or 44 of the 99 seats. So maybe a little less than half in a year that was good for the Democrats. And along the vertical axis, you have the number of counties that his simulation had to divide, where a line had to be drawn through the middle of a county, breaking it up. There's 72 counties in Wisconsin. On average, his maps were dividing uh, 22 or 23 uh, counties on average. The actual map that was in place, the one that was enacted back in 2001 and was challenged at the Supreme Court, is that star in the far right corner of the figure. That map gave Republicans 56 seats and preserved only 14 counties of the 72. That is, did not divide a very small number of counties. So that map gave it a much more advantage than you would expect from a random computer simulation and ended up cutting up local governments, dividing people who lived in the same county into different districts more than you would have to. So this was some evidence of the real intent to override some other important criteria in order to give one party an advantage over the other. Okay, so just more evidence of, of a really effective extreme uh, map that has stood the test of time and, and worked well for the dominant party. Now, is there any solution to this? In, in states now, uh, Democrats where they are in charge are drawing maps to give them side, to give themselves an advantage. Republicans are doing the same in states where they control the process. Is there any way out of this? Well, there's, there's no solution in terms of the federal courts. Filing a lawsuit in a federal district court, hoping to get to the Supreme Court to overturn a map because it's too partisan, is going nowhere. That is the outcome of the Rucho case that involved North Carolina, Maryland, and Wisconsin. But there are some other places where reformers had had some success in removing partisanship from the process. One way to, to fix things is to actually file litigation in a state court. Some state constitutions provide more protection for voters than the US Constitution does, and some Supreme Courts are still friendly to listening to arguments about maps that are too partisan. An example of this that happened within the last decade is a dispute over congressional districts in Pennsylvania. On the, and Pennsylvania, as you know, is a competitive state. It's one that Joe Biden narrowly won in 2020. Donald Trump had won it in 2016. So it's, it's, a, it's a place like Wisconsin that swings back and forth. The maps on the left, which were enacted by the Republican majority back in 2011, just like in Wisconsin, produced a big Republican advantage. In a purple state of the 18 districts, Republicans gave themselves 13, and there are only five, mostly in the Philadelphia area, in the lower right of the figure, that lean toward the Democrats. Uh, and the districts are also ugly. Some of the shapes are uh, clearly not compact and have kind of long straggling portions, including the district I showed you right at the beginning of the talk with Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. You can just see him uh, showing up there on the lower right. 
Well, those maps were challenged in the state Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed and hired an expert to come in and draw new congressional maps that were fairer and also more compact, had nicer shapes. The new maps are on the right-hand side. They still give the advantage to the Republicans. Now out of the 18 districts, 10 lean Republican, eight lean Democratic, but it is closer to balanced and the shapes of the districts are much more pleasing. So this was a case of a real success in reforming the districts that came not from the federal courts, but from the state's courts, state courts. So that's still a, a path for some reformers in some states. The other path that is moving much more rapidly are the creation of commissions to take the task of drawing districts away from state legislators. This was done uh, almost 20 years ago in California when Governor Schwarzenegger was in office. He was pushing for a citizens commission that eventually passed when the voters enacted it. They, they voted themselves to create the commission. It's a commission that includes a fixed number of Republicans, Democrats, and independents. They hold hearings across the state. They're required to come to a supermajority decision that involves supporting votes from the Republican members, the Democratic members, and the independent members on the commission. So it can't be a deal between the independents and one of the parties. It's really got to be broad agreement on the commission. And although there is some controversy, I think that commission has worked quite well. And the districts that are in place today uh, were drawn by it, and it is now busy doing its next round of things. Uh, just two years ago, in the 2018 midterm elections, four states passed referendums like the one in California and enacted commissions that would draw district maps. Maybe the most visible was in Michigan where a woman named Katie Fahey posted on her Facebook page, you can see that on the upper right, just after the election, saying she wanted to do something about this redistricting problem, who wanted to help her? And she was creating a group called Voters Not Politicians. That stray Facebook post ended up creating an organization that collected about half a million signatures in Michigan, put that issue on the ballot, it passed in 2018, and Michigan now has an independent Citizens Commission drawing the districts for this next round of congressional elections. Now, Wisconsin doesn't have the initiative available. It's not possible under state law to put something like that on the ballot and have voters decide it. And so there have been some workarounds to try to introduce this in Wisconsin. One came from Governor Evers, who created something called the People's Commission, or the People's Map Commission which is a collection of eight citizens from around the state, one from each congressional district that have been holding hearings all through this summer and fall and have just proposed some recommended maps. These are, these are only advisory uh, for the governor, the state legislature, maybe courts to consider. So those, those kinds of unofficial um, side commissions are also developing in some states. And here in Dane County, the Dane County Board of Supervisors, which are elected from a series of 37 districts created a nonpartisan citizens commission. And I got appointed to that commission. We've been working uh, really since the beginning of the year to draw those 37 districts in a way that's nonpartisan, does not account for incumbency, uh, is compact, preserves communities of interest, all the kinds of things you would care about. So there's some real models, I think, being adopted more widely across the states that should put some pressure on state legislatures that are trying to hold on to this power. Maybe the best model of all is one that has been in place in the state of Iowa since the 1970s. It's sometimes called the Iowa model. In Iowa, there's not a, an independent commission that draws districts. Instead, the task is given to an existing state agency, an agency in state government that already does work with maps, already has expertise, it's nonpartisan, it's unelected, uh, it's really insulated from political influence. And their job is to draw the districts quickly and transparently, and to not divide any of the counties in Iowa. So you can see on the left-hand side, the four congressional districts in Iowa that are in place today got drawn by this agency 10 years ago. They're, they're pretty nicely shaped. They sort of look like they were put together with Legos, which are the county building blocks. Uh, they are competitive districts. Two of them lean Republican. Two of them are, are quite competitive, but maybe lean a little bit towards the Democrats. So this has been a process that's worked very well. There's been really no lawsuits or controversy or expense or secrecy in Iowa. On the right-hand side, you see the drawing of the state legislative districts in Iowa. Some of those do need to cut counties because they are smaller, but still they, they look nice. They are more, more compact and more competitive and often uh, scarier for incumbents than are the maps that get adopted in other states. So I said at the outset that we were in the midst of the redistricting process now. 
just give you a sense for who controls this across the states. This is a figure from 538 showing which parties in charge in each state and how many of the congressional districts they control. The states that are shaded in gray either have independent commissions, states like California, or have divided government in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania so that neither party has full control. But there are still plenty of states where Democrats or especially Republicans have the governorship and the state legislature and can draw the maps. Uh, by 538's accounting, about 187 seats in the House will be coming from states where Republicans are in charge, about 75 seats from Democrats. So although it's less of an advantage than Republicans had 10 years ago, they still are in control of more places where districts will be drawn to favor their party. Okay, that is my look at what's happening with redistricting in Wisconsin. I really appreciate your sticking with me and uh, look forward to your questions. Harry, thank you so much. Uh, and you presented that in such a way that was really understandable. And I, uh, we really appreciate your analogies as well, the mouse cursor idea and things. So trying to put it in very simple terms. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. We're talking with Barry Burden today. So uh, you alluded in the beginning to um, that we're the only country in the world with this type of system. And I realize you're not an expert in other countries, but are other countries getting it right uh, in that regard? Or uh, where do we stand in that? Well, every, you know, every country has a different electoral system. So it's not just the drawing of the district lines. It's even what rules are used to elect people. And many countries have systems that aren't based on districts at all. That, you know, in, in many European countries, there's a list of candidates and voters choose a, a full list or maybe pick candidates from that list. But in countries that rely on districts, it's often a kind of boring administrative bureaucratic process where some quiet agency simply produces the new lines to, to keep up with population changes. They're very concerned about keeping cities together and counties and townships together, not wanting to divide communities, not wanting to divide school districts the kinds of things we care about a little bit less in the United States and sometimes produce some ugly, ugly, ugly looking districts. So it's not really a process that I think that most of the public or politicians are paying much attention to because it's sort of a routine administrative thing that's happening behind the scenes. So in that sense, it's better in that there's not controversy, there aren't lawsuits. It's not a source of hostility between the parties and the legislature. It's just a sort of uh, routine practice. In terms of uh, the general citizen getting involved, you mentioned these independent commissions. Is that an avenue that an average citizen could just seek those out and try to get involved? Obviously, voting uh, is important. Any other suggestions for the general, general people? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of ways to be involved. And I'll just take Wisconsin as an example. The governor's commission that I mentioned, the People's Map Commission, has been accepting submissions of maps from the public and has provided free software for the public to go in and draw maps themselves and submit them. And those were part of their deliberations. Uh, the state legislature for their part has also created a portal where people can submit maps, again, drawing with free software. It's, it's sort of fun and aggravating to try out. So I encourage people to give it a whirl. And the Dane County Commission that I'm part of has also accepted maps from the public, again, providing a free platform for citizens to do that. And I think an increasing number of states and communities around the country are having these kind of map making competitions. Sometimes students get involved or government classes get involved. Uh, civic groups like the League of Women Voters will often submit maps that they want to be considered. So that's in a, if you're in a place that allows public input of that kind, that's a really great way, a kind of educational way just to see how difficult it is, but also for you to share your vision of what you think the maps ought to be. There are also a number of reform groups that are really agitating to try to get commissions or other kinds of fixes put in states. There are some groups in Wisconsin that are doing this sort of thing. So there's a place. If you're upset about this process, there are, there are really ways to be involved. Great. That's great information. Thank you. So what if the people making the maps and the parties can't agree and then it becomes election time? Like what, what happens there? Yeah, that's a real concern this time because the census data were delivered so late to the states. Normally the census would be conducted in the year ending in zero every 10 years. So that would have been 2020. The data would be handed to the states in about the spring, say April of the year after. And then states would spend the summer, maybe into the fall drawing the districts and would have them in place by now. That would have been the plan in Wisconsin, for example. 
The trouble is the census was massively delayed, mostly because of COVID. It was just very difficult to go door to door collecting that kind of information and some other political disputes about what was going to be in the census and what wouldn't be. And as a result, the data didn't get handed to the states until August. Uh, and so there's a tight timeline, especially for states that have early elections next year, maybe spring elections or have primaries that are coming up in the spring or summer. Candidates need to know where, what districts they live in and where they should file their papers and who their voters will be. But without the districts in place, they can't do that. So I think there is a fear that in some places the districts will not be ready in time. That will be compounded if there are lawsuits, if groups are unhappy about the maps that do get adopted file a lawsuit and maybe a court puts those maps on hold, it's possible that in some places you will see courts order that the old maps stay in place for another cycle, that we continue to use the previous maps. That actually happened in Texas a few years ago where the map makers couldn't agree on a new set of district lines. The court intervened. Uh, there were a number of lawsuits and the judge finally said, all right, we're going to continue with the old maps for one more cycle. Now that obviously advantages the party that drew those old maps. So in some cases, they're actually filing suit to try to keep the new maps from coming into place sooner because they'd like to get one more election cycle out of the old maps that were drawn to their advantage. So even the machinations that are going on in the court, including in Wisconsin, where there are now multiple lawsuits in both state and federal court, that's all trying to get an advantage in terms of the timing of all of this, the venue, what judges are gonna be thinking about and who's ultimately gonna be drawing those maps. Wow, thanks for that answer. And that's really motivation for us all to get involved and try to do our parts. Um, we do have a question here posted from Doug Bradley. Was the Iowa model recommended as an antidote in either of the Supreme Court cases that you cited? It wasn't. And I'll, I'll just say that although the majority in the Supreme Court said that this was not an issue for them, they didn't think the Supreme Court had any role in controlling partisanship and maps. They did say they were unhappy with the process. They thought it was problematic. Uh, they thought it was mean-spirited. It was probably unfair to voters. It just didn't rise to the level of violating the Constitution of the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment or some of the other amendments that were invoked. But they didn't offer a solution, <laughs> really. They said the solution was voters, that if voters were unhappy with the districts, they should vote out the people who are in office and replace them with people who were going to do this in a fair way. But as the minority on the court pointed out, if the maps are rigged to advantage the majority, it's actually not possible for the minority, for the voters to vote that majority party out. You know, in the data I showed on Wisconsin, you could see that in the before and after elections around that redistricting, the Republicans continue to have majorities, even though the Democratic vote share went up. That was a, a consistent story through the last decade. Wisconsin's a purple state. We've had some years when Democrats win big and some years when Republicans win big, and it's affected the presidential races here, the governor's races, Senate races. State legislature has been immune from all of that, really completely insulated with very durable, reliable Republican majorities. So in my view, the solution that the court was offering was one that just doesn't work in a state where one party has advantaged themselves so much that it's not possible for voters to then put in new politicians who would be more favorable. Uh, they did not highlight the Iowa model at all, but I think for people who really watch this process closely, there's a, a kind of admiration for what's happened in Iowa that they very quietly have done this since the 1970s. And um, you know, it's, it's often a swing state and, and uh, it's managed to work there. So whether or not the court likes it, I'm, I'm gonna recommend it as one that ought to be seriously considered. Thank you. Uh, one last question from viewers here. So Karen Murphy says, regarding redistricting, do referendum votes have any impact? They do not in Wisconsin. Uh, this is another way that citizens can be involved. Uh, there have been referendums put on the ballot in a number of counties around the state, asking people whether they think a fair map system ought to be put in place. And I think in every county where that's been put on the ballot, it has passed. So there's clearly public support for the idea generally, but those are non-binding resolutions. They're simply a message to the county officials or state officials. We're unhappy with what you're doing, but it doesn't actually change anything. So it, in a way, it's like the governor's commission or the maps that the Republican legislature is accepting. It's all advisory. Now, that, that kind of pressure might be helpful in the end. It might influence a court at some point if they get a case um, around redistricting of you know, and, and they take that into consideration. Uh, but unfortunately, it's really 
just a statement rather than changing the law. Great. Thanks so much uh, for taking time with us today. And thanks for your work with all of the students on our campus and helping educate all of our viewers. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us today, Barry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, please continue to join us as we will now transition back to our celebration of the Science Festival this month. The Wisconsin Science Festival will take place October 21 to 24. Check out wisconsinsciencefest.org for more information. We're going to be uh, talking with professors of philosophy, Larry Shapiro and Stephen Nadler on October 12th, this coming Tuesday at noon. They're gonna be talking about their new book, When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, and presenting their argument that the best antidote for the current epidemic of bad thinking is the wisdom, insights, and practical skills of philosophy. And then we'll continue with our celebration of the Science Festival by talking to the co-founders of the Science Festival, Laura Heisler and George Sugros. And they're gonna be giving us an insider's glimpse into the Science Festival and how you can best participate. Be sure to visit us at badgertalks.wisc.edu. You can see our uh, new podcast launched with Ben Rush. And Ben actually talked to Barry, so that uh, episode is available out there and we'll be launching another on October 12th with the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Science Festival. See our upcoming schedule of talks. We have hosted talks as well as talks that we're producing. So there's a long list of talks out there for you to engage with. Sign up for our email list if you'd like to get notification of those talks. Consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant from the Alumni Association. And you can also search our roster of over 400 faculty and staff from UW-Madison who generously volunteer their time to give talks around the state for host groups and in communities like yours. Thanks for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday.